Hello, and welcome to Field Lab Earth, the podcast that's all about past and present advances in the fields of agronomic, crop, soil, and environmental sciences. Today, we'll be talking to Matthew Smitty War, Dr. Sherry Flint Garcia, and Dr. James Jim Holland about breeding low protein varieties of corn for individuals with phenylketonuria. Phenylketonuria is a metabolic disorder which results in a need for a strict low protein diet. This restricts the intake of corn and many corn-based foods. This episode, Smitty, Sherry, and Jim discuss their work developing a low-protein corn variety so that individuals with phenylketonuria can enjoy more corn-based foods. Don't forget to listen to the end for our new student spotlight section as well. We'll talk more about all that in a minute, but before we dive in, we wanted to thank our sponsors, starting with Meter Group. Meter specializes in robust soil moisture sensing, innovative weather monitoring, cloud data logging, advanced data visualization software, and more. Their well-published scientific instrumentation is used worldwide in universities, research and testing labs, government agencies, agriculture, and industrial applications. Listen to their new podcast, We Measure the World, to hear how innovative researchers leverage environmental data to make our world a better and more sustainable place at metagroup.com slash field lab earth. Our second sponsor is Gazman Technologies, the maker of the GT5000 Terra, the smallest portable FTIR multi-gas analyzer for greenhouse gas and environmental research. Measure carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, ammonia, and water vapor in real time simultaneously from static or automated chambers and ruminant emissions. Visit www.gazmet.com, that's gazmet spelled G-A-S-M-E-T, or email sales at gazmet.com for more information. I'm your host, Abby Morrison. Let's talk about science. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. Today we have Matthew Smitty War with us, Sherry Flint Garcia, and Jim Holland. Smitty earned his bachelor's in design from Clemson University and his master's in crop science from North Carolina State University, where he is now a PhD candidate. Between stints at university, he served as a KC 135 pilot in the U.S. Air Force and worked for FedEx and BMW. Sherry obtained her bachelor's degree in biology from St. Mary's University of Minnesota, obtained her Ph.D. in genetics from the University of Missouri, spent two years as a postdoctoral researcher at North Carolina State University, and has worked for USDA ARS as a research geneticist in Columbia, Missouri since 2006. Jim holds a bachelor's in biology from Johns Hopkins University, a master's in plant breeding and plant genetics from the University of Wisconsin, and a Ph.D. in crop science from North Carolina State University. He's been a research geneticist with USDA in Raleigh, North Carolina since 1999. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Pretty good. Awesome. Wonderful. We are so glad to have you on the show. Very excited for today's episode. So to get us started, we're going to kind of lay some groundwork here. So you are studying a metabolic disorder, uh, phenylketonuria, if I pronounced that correctly. If not, please correct me. So can you start off by telling us a little bit about what this disorder is, how it affects people, and kind of what your goal was with your research to address this? Right. So um, I probably don't know how to pronounce it either. This is Jim, by the way, and um, I say phenyl ketonuria. That may also be wrong. It's much easier to say PKU. That's the acronym that Perfect. Uh, people use. So uh, PKU is an inherited uh, metabolic disorder that is identified in infants. So when a baby is born in the U.S., they will take little blood spots, and those are tested to see if the uh, blood amino acid levels are all in the normal range, and they, they can also test for other disorders. And one thing that they sometimes will identify is that an infant will have very high levels of the amino acid phenylalanine. And the reason that happens is because that child, the baby, does not have a functioning enzyme called phenylalanine hydroxylase. And without that enzyme, Uh, What normally should happen is the phenylalanine, the body can convert that to tyrosine, a different amino acid, and then there's a series of pathways that will eliminate that from the body. Um, And without the functioning enzyme, phenylalanine builds up. We actually consume more of this in our diets than we actually need. And if your body can't get rid of the excess, 
these amino acids will actually go through the bloodstream to the brain membrane, and they'll interfere with brain function, causes severe uh, uh, mental uh, retardation in, in infants if it's not treated. And it also has to be treated f- throughout the life uh, of the patient by following a very low protein diet. So they restrict the intake of total protein. That's then supplemented with um, a medical formula that has all the other amino acids that the body needs, but they take out the phenylalanine. And then the patients will have essentially a vegetarian diet, and it's even stricter than vegetarian because anything that's high in protein, the patient really can't eat. So nuts are out, legumes, you know, beans are out. Even the grains are um, pretty high for a PKU patient. And so whatever grains they can eat, it can only be in quite small quantities. So, you know, a, a, a PKU patient might want to eat a tortilla or some, you know, taco chips, things like that. And they wouldn't be able to eat very much of it. it would be, they, only a very small amount would be permitted in the diet. So one thing we thought was, is there a way through classical breeding that we could develop corn varieties that have lower levels of uh, either phenylalanine specifically or just total protein? Either of those would probably get the job done. So the patients could uh, eat higher amounts of of corn-based products. It still would not be unlimited. They'd still have to restrict it somewhat, but if we could cut the typical protein level more or less in half, that would allow the patients to consume twice as much as they normally would. So that was the basic idea. Um, we're, none of us are dietitians or physicians or medical people. Uh, we're plant breeders. And so, you know, we just thought this is one thing maybe we can contribute to the, um, to the maintenance of um, try to make the maintenance of the diet for patients a little bit easier. Sure. Obviously a, a very serious condition with huge impacts on, on people's lives. Um, so you were hoping to breed this lower protein corn variety, and you kind of had a, a bit of a two-step process in your research to try and uh, begin that breeding process. So can you tell me a bit about what your methods were, how you went about doing this research? Sure. Uh, this is Sherry. Uh, so our process involved planting field trials out in the field and then evaluating the grain from those and trying to get at how much phenylalanine is in different varieties. And so Smitty will talk about the field experiments, but first I'll go into what phenylalanine is. So the all the amino acids of your in your body are the building blocks for proteins. All organisms ranging from humans and other animals to plants and microorganisms like bacteria and viruses and everything in between have proteins that are made of amino acids. There are 20 basic amino acids, uh, nine of which are essential because the human body cannot produce them and we have to get them from our food. Uh, the other 11 amino acids can be synthesized in our bodies, but it's these nine essential amino acids that are trickier for human nutrition. We need to have a certain amount, but not too much. And usually, when a protein is digested in your body, it's broken down into the constituent amino acids, which then the body can then reassemble into the proteins that it uses on a daily basis. And as Jim mentioned, when we have a high-protein diet, we consume way more protein and way more phenylalanine, uh, one of those essentially amino acids, um, that our body really needs. And so Jim mentioned that we have a special enzyme that breaks down into other molecules that our body can then recycle and build new amino acids and new other proteins. So it's very difficult to balance the intake that in your food to match the needs of the human body as the body grows and develops over time and repairs itself on a daily basis. We started the whole process out by just trying to identify what, um, you know, what, what, varieties of, of corn we could plant and that would be naturally low in protein to see how, how big the variation was you know, between a high protein and a low protein, you know, how effective is breeding likely to be on that. So um, we designed a, a field experiment. It, it operated in 
two small portions. One portion tested a lot of different inbred materials, and, and this is uh, varieties that for several generations, the plant has been pollinated with its own pollen so that it gets progressively more inbred over time until finally uh, seven, six, seven generations in. You basically can assume that the the plant is uh, both the pairs of chromosomes are functionally identical. We'll call it that. Um, so that, you know, you have a good idea of what this plant looks like, uh, you know, what the genes of this plant are really doing. And when you plant a field full of inbreds, they pretty much all look the same, if it's the same inbred. Well, there's thousands of those things out there. And so we tested about 55 uh, of them or 60 of them over the course of two seasons. Um, and we also tested in two locations. So uh, both at Clayton, North Carolina, where Jim and I are working, and then out in Columbia, uh, where Sherry's located. So uh, we ran this for, for two seasons. And the, the second half of the experiment, which was, you know, the, they were planted in the same field, but the second part, we tested a bunch of hybrids and uh, open pollinated varieties. And this basically a hybrid, which is almost all the corn you'll ever see, you know, driving along by the side of the road is, is hybrids where uh, two inbred parents have been crossed. You know, uh, we use the pollen from one to pollinate the ears of the other. We get much stronger plants, much higher yields. Everything's a lot better. The reason why hybrids are used is because you can't get much out of an inbred, but when you cross them together, you have what's uh, called heterosis, which is just a, a hybrid vigor. So hybrids are much stronger plants. Um, ultimately, you know, our goal would be to do a hybrid that had low protein rather than inbreds, but you, you learn a lot from testing these inbreds. Um, and the other thing I mentioned, the open pollinated varieties, these are just uh, generally very old, what, you know, might be termed heirlooms or sometimes land races. Um, the predate the hybrid revolution at the beginning of the 20th century, where basically you just planted a field of corn and the, it pollinated itself. And over time, you know, you know, my field in North Carolina would have something different from your field in Missouri, from somebody's field in New Mexico, from somebody's field in Mexico. And so those different open pollinated varieties might, we wanted to see whether those would have, you know, some kind of a, a difference in uh, protein levels relative to everything else. So for two seasons, we planted all these things out in the fields and we uh, self or sibling pollinated uh, plants within the row. And then we harvested and we took all those ears that we got and we ran them through what's referred to as near infrared spectrometry uh, or nears. Um, and that gives us a good estimate of the total amount of protein in the kernel. And we additionally did um, a complete metabolic analysis, not metabolic, but we'll call it an amino acid analysis, um, uh, using a process called uh, acid hydrolysis, which was done for us by the um, experimental station Chem Lab uh, in Columbia, Missouri, uh, using the official uh, approved methodology for determining exactly how much protein is in it and exactly how much of the various amino acids is found. And it doesn't search for tryptophan, but it finds everything else. Uh, and that way we could, you know, kind of compare how good was our NEARS estimate, which is very cheap, against the absolute real method that is very expensive, <laughs> and uh, see what we found and, and what the range was like and what we could learn about how, how we might proceed with a breeding program. Okay, I have a couple of questions off of that. So uh, first question is where, like, where were you getting all of these varieties from? Were you going from like a seed bank or just like what is common in your areas? Um, yeah. How'd you find them? Well, uh, Jim may want to jump in on this too, but it, a lot of them were things, you know, like our program we had in storage because they've been used in the past. But the truth is, if you wanted to do something like this, the USDA maintains a really important germplasm bank uh, for corn up in Ames, Iowa. And all of the varieties we tested um, basically, you know, 
we could retrieve a small amount from that facility and grow them out. And for the hybrids that we tested, we had to make the hybrids ourselves. In most cases, we, we did throw a couple commercial ones in to see what they looked like. But um, basically, you know, it was it was the goal was to get as broad a population as possible. So we used inbreds that had been developed in different parts of the country, different parts of the world, uh, during different eras, some of them by commercial companies, some of them by academics, things like that. Okay. So it wasn't just like ones that you thought would probably maybe just be low protein for whatever reason already? Uh, well, except for one that is known as the Illinois low protein line. Um, there was really no way to know for sure uh, when we started. We did, there was some prior research done, um, particularly by uh, Sherry's team uh, in years past that had done some protein testing on a, a variety of things. Um as part of a, an unrelated project, but we really just tried to capture as much genetic diversity as we could just to see, you know, what would pop out. Sure, sure. All right. Then my second follow-up question is uh, for the NEARS versus like the in-depth chemical analysis, did you like do the NEARS testing first to kind of knock out some ones that you didn't really need to, that you were just like, nah, this is super high in protein already. We don't need to test it further. Or were you just like, no, do everything, and maybe we'll be surprised somewhere along the line. How did that work? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, we did start with NEARS. Um, you know, once the equipment is purchased, and Sherry can speak more to that because um, it, her lab has the machine, um, once that equipment's purchased, it's essentially, you know, free <laughs> to do as many tests as you need to, uh, all it takes is time. And as a as a graduate student, you know, time doesn't cost anything for me. For real people, it might mean something. But um, it, after we had come up with our initial estimates through the NEARS, then we took a look at things and said, well, what what should we, based on how how many uh, samples we could afford to test. Which ones should we test based on? Which ones are lowest or in some cases also highest? Um, it's good to honestly get a range so that we could then compare the NEARS estimate to the actual, uh, you know, the, the full hydrolysis technique and see whether our estimates were good or whether there was any, you know, how good's the relationship between the estimate and reality? Can we get away with just using the estimate every year to select the lowest protein things for the next season? Or do we really need to do more testing? So um, we, we used a subset, um, probably 20%, I'd say, of the uh, different varieties. Um, we focused on the lower protein ones, but we did try to use a full range of different kernel types and, and different uh, um, protein levels just so that we'd be able to make, you know, get a good idea of how good our estimates are. Sure. Makes sense to me. Um, did anyone else have anything on the methods before we move on? Um, I would like to speak a little bit about the NIR. So the near infrared method that we use is based on reflectance. Um, different machines use different methods, whether they measure absorbance or reflectance. But our NIR machine uh, does reflectance. And so what we did is we took the harvested grain from all of our plots that uh, Cindy described from the different environments and scanned them with our near-infrared machine. Uh, this is a really cheap, uh, fast, non-destructive way, the way that we do it, to predict grain protein content. Um, and so in near-infrared spectroscopy, we have a machine that uh, directs uh, beams of light of different wavelengths. In our case, we measure 400 to 2400 nanometers uh, different at different times. So it'll do 400 nanometers and then 410 nanometers and 420 nanometers. And over this different uh, spectra, different wavelengths are uh, shown onto the grain and different amounts are absorbed and different amounts are reflected. And the machine records how much is reflected in our case. And we take some samples which are known protein content, so we scan them in the machine, and we develop a, a model for predicting protein and other constituents of the grain uh, from the different spectra. And then that way, 
uh, we can put any other sample in with unknown values of protein and then estimate the amount of protein in our sample. And this is a really great method for us. We can put whole kernels in and get good estimates. And then we can, based on our selections, plant those kernels without having to grind them up to make a meal. And that would, of course, be a destructive method. Sure, sure. So it's kind of like you take a picture of like your control uh, protein and then you do like take a picture. I mean, in the same way that human eyes like <laughs> see what's refracted off of uh, objects and then you like compare them to see how close they are. Is that like a, a fair analogy? That is a wonderful analogy. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Great. <laughs> I was worried I was leading people astray. Uh, well, that's great. And then are you just doing like one kernel at a time or do you just have like a tray that's full of them so you're like testing more than one kernel or is just one kernel enough? Right. So that's a really good question. Um, the kernel, when you look at a kernel of corn, it has two sides to it. If you look at the kernel, you'll see on one side there is the embryo. And if you flip it over, there's no embryo. That's just the way corn is. And so it turns out that the oil is contained mostly in the embryo and the protein in the starch is in the non-embryo portion of the kernel, the endosperm. And so it would matter which way the kernel is facing to get different amounts of starch, protein, and oil using near infrared. And so we don't do single kernels using our method but other people do have a method to, to do single kernel analysis. That's just not the equipment we have. And uh, so what we do is we take a sample of the grain um, and it will be, uh, we have a little vessel that we put the seeds in and the kernels can be forwards and backwards in a random fashion. And then we do the scans on that. And then we will typically dump the seed out, and put the seed in again, the exact same sample, so we get a different combination of forward facing and backward facing. And that way we can kind of get an unbiased uh, system, uh, estimate of our protein. Uh, but there are certainly other systems out there who can do a single kernel. Hi everyone, I hope you're enjoying the show. Interested in learning more? Smitty, Sherry, and Jim's paper, The Potential to Breed a Low-Protein Maze for Protein-Restricted Diets, published in Crop Science, will be freely available for the next two weeks. If you are a certified crop advisor or certified professional soil scientist, you can take a quiz for continuing education units for this episode, which can be found in our show notes or on certifiedcropadvisor.org. Thanks again also to our sponsors, Gazmet Technologies and Meter Group. For Gasmet Technologies, the GT5000 Terra is a robust and portable multi-gas analyzer for field work, weighing 20.7 pounds. The GT5000 Terra is splash-proof IP54 rated with an internal pump and battery and instantaneous readings of up to 50 gases at sub-PPM concentrations. Check out the quick setup guide and learn more about Gasmet Technologies at www.gasmet.com and the links in the show notes. Meter specializes in robust soil moisture sensing, innovative weather monitoring, cloud data logging, advanced data visualization software, and more. Their well-published scientific instrumentation is used worldwide in universities, research and testing labs, government agencies, agriculture, and industrial applications. Listen to their new podcast, We Measure the World, to hear how innovative researchers leverage environmental data to make our world a better and more sustainable place at metergroup.com slash fieldlabearth. Thank you for being our sponsor. Let's get back to the show. Oh, that's very neat. I'm very glad that I asked. <laughs> so, all right. I think that is uh, enough to, to move us on to our next section, which is the results. So what did you find? Um, well, this is Smitty. And uh, for starters, what we found was a nice broad range of kernel protein content, um, ranging from as high as uh, 17% down to an average of about uh, 5% uh, for that low protein line I mentioned, which is kind of a, a special case. Uh, and uh, that nice broad range, you know, proves to us uh, that we definitely can do some selection and we can 
I identify the low protein ones and cross them together. And we ought to be able to drive that range down. Um, you know, if we'd seen that everything ranged between 10 and 10.5 percent, we'd say, hmm, I'm not sure there's anything that we can do here. But uh, the nice uh, broad range lets us know that we ought to be able to drive these uh, the protein level down. Uh, it's interesting to note that the hybrids, although we tested slightly more high, uh, inbreds than hybrids, um, the inbreds had a narrower range and the hybrids had kind of a broader range. Um, and that has uh, some things to do with the, the way that that heterosis uh, that I mentioned that, that the hybrids benefit from uh, acts in the corn kernel in that it, it tends to greatly increase the starch fraction of the kernel without having a whole lot of effect to the oil and protein fractions of the kernel. But, you know, uh, different uh, hybrids are of different quality. And so that heterosis is not a universal constant amount of anything. It's just when you cross two inbreds, you get some amount of it and, you know, you pick the ones that are best. So there's a little bit more um, uh, just room to wiggle, I'd say, within those things. Um, and then looking at the, when we tested uh, for phenylalanine specifically, um, we found also a fairly broad range. But what we also found, and we had suspected this based on some, some prior research, but what we also found was that the phenylalanine content and the protein content track really closely together um, to the degree that, uh, that the correlation between how much phenylalanine is, is in the kernel and how much protein overall is in the kernel. Um, you can really just look at the protein and roll with it. Um, it's so close that correlations, you know, over 90%. It's, it's so close that you don't really have to test specifically for phenylalanine, uh, which is really great because again, that's, you know, we need to know that we can do this with the, the faster and less expensive method and not with the time consuming and uh, extremely costly method. So uh, that was really good news. And then we, uh, looked at the samples that we, you know, we had scanned samples with the NEARS and then we sent some of those samples forward, you know, for that destructive analysis. And we compared um, what those, those specific samples, uh, how they looked. So if our NEARS told us that something was 10% um, protein, did was it actually 10% or was it 8% or 12 or, or did, was there any relationship at all? And what we determined was that there is a pretty good relationship, particularly with the hybrids, um, good enough that we can quite comfortably make selections on the basis of what the NEARS tells us and test at the end, uh, you know, to identify what lines we have that are best. But we'll know that we haven't really, if, if we're selecting the, you know, the lowest 20%, say, um, every season, the lowest protein 20% every season, we'll get the low ones in there. You know, there, there will be a little bit of, you know, some things might be a little higher than we thought or a little lower than we thought. But, you know, when we just collect that you know, lowest batch of things, uh, we're going to get the low stuff in there, uh, even if it's you know not exactly the the perfect one. So we can we can comfortably test on you know just the nears and proceed uh, with breeding, which means that we can do this you know right now immediately and and not have to worry about you know securing huge amounts of funding to do all of this you know destructive testing and things like that. And we can just you know proceed and and actually start working with it. So. That was very good. One thing that we did determine, um, several of the hybrids that we tested were made from several of the inbreds that we tested, meaning that, you know, we, we tested, you know, inbred A and inbred B, and we also tested hybrid A times B. So we were able to compare A, B, and A, B, and when we did that, we found that consistently whatever kernel protein we found in A and in B, it was lower in AB. Now, that, again, that was expected because you know, we 
I mentioned that that heterosis really affects the starch fraction. The kernels are much more filled with starch. Um, so per unit weight, there's going to be less protein in there if the protein amount isn't, you know, being affected. Um, but to f it was quite consistent, and even the lower protein parents still we still saw that lower protein in the hybrids. So that gave us you know another nice thing to think about going forward that we would want to really focus on finding specifically on finding the lower protein parents that we could use to you know to make our crosses. So there's there's it's worth trying to get trying to breed inbreds that are low protein so that we can make hybrids out of them because we'll still capture some of that heterosis even even when the inbreds have very low kernel protein. Great. Well, that's really promising results. Uh, that's great news that you had such good news <laughs> when you finished <laughs> your research, I guess. Um, so... Obviously, though, there are quite a few steps from uh, these initial steps to getting them into corn products that people can purchase, um, and obviously just more breeding to be done. So can you tell me more about the future of this research, what the next steps are, and then how to bridge that gap from having a finished low-protein variety to getting that into stores and to the people that need it? Well, I can definitely get us started on that um, because we have already started on that. So using the uh, information that we had, we selected a number of low protein inbred and open pollinated parents. Um, I, my other research involves a lot of open pollinated varieties and heirlooms, and they have good food quality traits. And since our goal here ultimately is to come up with something that can be used to make food. Um, I wanted to use some of those. And so sometimes the open pollinated varieties were not as low in protein as some of the other inbreds that we used. But we crossed all of our selected, you know, potential parents, of which we had about a dozen, um, to the Illinois low protein line. And I'll digress a little bit on that. Um, starting way back in the 1890s, uh, researchers at the University of Illinois began what is now known as the Illinois Long-Term Selection Experiment. Um, and they started from a single open pollinated population of corn that was being grown in the Champaign area uh, called Burr White. And they put it out there in the field and every year they selected some ears, you know, the lowest protein ears, the highest protein ears, the lowest oil ears, the highest oil ears. And they just did that every single year for years and years. And, and I'm sure at some point somebody said, wow, we've been doing this for 40 or 50 years now. We really need to keep doing it. Uh, and thank goodness they did because it's still going on. So, you know, we're, we're 120 years into this experiment now. Um, the low protein line, uh, somewhere around generation 70 or 75, um, they, it, they found that it had bottomed out uh, at about 5% protein. And it, there would have to be a, you know, biological lower limit because the seed needs some amount of protein to germinate and grow. Um, and, you know, different years, it would be a little higher or a little lower. And, and there's a lot of environmental variation there. But, you know, ultimately, it just kind of bottomed out at about that, you know, around 5%, a little bit below it. So we had access to some of that seed because um, in generation 62, which is pretty close to the bottom, um, the researchers donated all four of those, the high and low protein and the high and low oil, they, they donated some seed from all of those lines to that germplasm bank in Ames so that it would be available for researchers. So we had that and we planted it and we tested it and it is, of course, very low in protein and it's also very horrible uh, as a plant. Um, it, it's, it doesn't germinate well. It looks very, it, you know, it's disease prone. Uh, it's just a weak plant. Um, but, you know, that's why we make hybrids. <laughs> so we used that as a parent. And then those, you know, the dozen other varieties that uh, we kind of identified as being particularly low in protein or, or of, you know, food quality interest. Uh, and we 
started that process. We had the made those hybrids and then started uh, selfing within those hybrid lines. So, you know, each year we would self-pollinate a whole bunch of plants of each line and then we'd test and then we'd keep the low protein ones and so forth and so on. So there's still more generations of selfing that could be done. Um, you know, we're, we're around the fourth generation right now, so uh, they're not fully inbred. But over time, um, we kicked out, I think, seven of the 12, you know, families that we started with. Um, and we kind of identified what the lowest protein lines were. And, and then, you know, um, two summers ago, I guess, in 2020, we did generate some hybrids between those different uh, low protein lines, even though they weren't fully inbred, um, you know, uh, just to see what, where we were going and, and, and how things were looking. And, and so, uh, ultimately the goal is going to be to identify good quality, uh, low protein lines, whether we start with, you know, necessarily one of the lines that we still have, or start with some fresh, uh, new hybrids, you know, new F1 hybrids, just to try to capture other food quality traits or something that we want. Um, but ultimately, you know, the goal will be to identify two or maybe four of the best inbred lines that we have and get them stable. And then we'll be able to generate um, hybrid seed from by crossing those two populations. And then that hybrid seed can be given to growers who will have to be contracted um, to grow only this and to grow it in isolation so it's not getting pollen from higher protein things, although that shouldn't affect the amount of kernel protein significantly. We still want it to stay isolated. Um, uh, but maybe Jim or Sherry might have some more uh, insight on like the longer term plans. This is Jim. So we're, we're Sherry and I are USDA, Agriculture Research Service people, and USDA is not a seed company, so it's we we can't go into the business of selling these varieties to, to growers. That's not our goal. But our goal might be to work with a, a small seed company, or it may not even be a seed company. It could be just a, a specialty grower who, who would understand how to produce hybrids and, and grow them in isolation. Obviously, this variety would have to be maintained in isolation so that keeps the low protein characteristic and, and isn't contaminated by other corn varieties. And then that would have to be tracked all the way into the food product. So, so there's a whole chain there that we would not control, but hopefully we would be able to, uh, if there's interest from the, from the specialty food companies, and I know a few of them, and there's not that many. So it's, so it's, I kind of know the people that we need to talk to when we get to that point. And, um, you know, they, they could then um, indicate that there's interest in it. And then hopefully we could identify a seed, seed company or a specialty grower to produce the material under contract with one of these companies that would then produce foods and get it to the uh, patient community. And then from my perspective, um, I work a lot on uh, moving my program towards some food quality traits and then producing good taste in corn products. So ultimately, the question is, do these things taste good? And so for me, that's the next realm where we're going to have to generate enough seed to do some tasting, making tortillas or making cornmeal or tasting it in different ways, different food uses. That's the exciting part for me. Well, that's great. That is some really promising future research. Obviously, great to be able to help people and make products that uh, are going to taste good as well as meet their nutritional needs. So I've got three questions left for you. So the first one is if people want to learn more about any of the things that we've talked about today, where can they go to do that? To uh, learn more about... PKU, there's a, there's a couple of patient groups that have good websites that has, you know, good medical information there. And that is um, pkunews.org. And the other one is NPK, sorry, npkua.org. So that's the National PKU Association.org. 
So that, that's good information there. Um, <clears throat> if you want to learn more about our overall research program, uh, uh, I, we have, both Sherry and I have a web presence through the USDA ARS uh, website. So that would be, you could just go to ars.usda.gov and then you'd have to look around a little bit, but you could find us that way. Great. Uh, we'll include links to all of those resources in the show notes. Smitty, did you have anything to add for resources? Um, I don't have anything uh, specific to this that that I would add. Um my uh my we we will have another paper on this subject out in you know before too much longer so hopefully there will be more information to share soon wonderful okay and then if people then want to take the next step and get involved with any of this kind of research uh what can they do to get started hire me <laughs> <laughs> Uh, graduation is approaching, so that is one of those things I think about. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Step one. We'll have, we'll have your contact info in the show notes. So there you go, people. It's right here, ready mm -hmm. to go. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I feel like, um, you know, with this kind of thing... I, PKU is not well known uh, by the population at large, and, and so I think honestly, for a lot of people, the next step would just be learning about, you know, what it is, um, and you know, what people who live with it, you know, have to do daily. And uh, it's honestly, it's it's very expensive. <laughs> um, so having more food access is good. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, definitely sounds like a very difficult uh, situation to, to live with. So thanks again for doing research to help alleviate that. Final question is, what is one fun or interesting fact that people would not know about you if all they had was your research? All right, I'll out myself. So yeah, during the pandemic, you know, people, people were going crazy and trying to learn new ways to spend their time. So I, I started skateboarding. So, <laughs> okay. Like I'm in my fifties. So yeah, it's my, my children are horribly embarrassed by this and I should be, but I'm not. So I just, you know, I strap on all the uh, pads and put the helmet on. And, hey, and no I, reason I goes, to be embarrassed. That's <laughs> rad. <laughs> More power to you. I love that. I skateboard for fun, but like I'm an old guy. So like, ow, my knees are hurting. So, you know, we'll see how long it lasts. Jim also has the power to identify really obscure bands when they're playing in the middle of my playlist. And I, I have to think for a minute whether he's like, oh, yeah, that is that group. It's it's uncanny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do have the profile of a – parts of me have a profile of a 20-year-old. But <laughs> I, I'm an old – I'm an old man. <laughs> So um, I'll go next. <laughs> uh, so I'm an avid gardener and a baking fanatic. And so I tend to find that I produce far more vegetables and baked goods than anybody in my family can consume. So I'm often uh, wandering around campus, uh, sharing with my coworkers, sharing with my neighbors, bringing food to the local food bank in the summertime. So um, overproduction is my name and my game. I, uh, I remain a licensed uh, commercial and instrument pilot and was actually uh, working as a flight instructor up until about 2000, gosh, 10, I guess. It's all blends together now. Um, so uh, it's, it's one of those things that I don't ever plan to do professionally for any reason. But, you know, hey, it's fun to be able to do yeah, once in a while when you want to. Wow. Um, Wow, what a what a fascinating bunch of people. You guys are all super cool. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you for being awesome. Thank you for putting in so much hard work to help people who uh, really need it. And, yeah, thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Abby. 
Thank you. And um, if I am allowed to do this, I would like to plug uh, sometime in the late spring, probably uh, May, I plan to start a podcast of my own. And it will be called Plant Food, because somehow that name is not yet taken. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the uh, kind of human history of different crop species and, and how it came to pass that we eat so much of the same things over and over again and, and trying to highlight some of the interesting stories about that stuff. So if anybody wants to look up the Plant Food Podcast, it, it will be around. And I already have, uh, you know, website and Gmail and things like that associated with it. So. Wow. Yeah, please, please feel free to plug. Um, <laughs> that's wonderful. We will uh, send me send me a link when you've got that up and running and we'll we'll be sure to give you a boost on our channels. Thank you. Um, yeah. So thanks for thanks for being on and thanks for all you do. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Student Spotlight, where we highlight the work of graduate and undergraduate society student members. Today, we'll be talking to Brooke. Hi, Brooke. Welcome to the show. Can you start us off by introducing yourself and where you're studying? Hey, yeah. I'm Brooke Cadle, and I'm a master's student at the University of Tennessee. Um, I work under Dr. Virginia Sykes in the Agroecology and Variety Testing Lab here. Great. And what are you currently researching? Um, I'm researching winter cover crops that could also be sold as cash crops here in the South. Um, my experiments specifically revolve around the production of canola, pennycress, and camelina, which all fall under the category of winter oil seeds. Um, this project addresses sustainability in multiple levels of the agriculture supply chain because adding another for-profit crop in conventional corn and soybean rotations could stimulate rural economic growth, increase on-farm biodiversity, promote winter cover, and the oil seeds can also be used to create sustainable biofuels. Wonderful. And if you could have your dream research project, what would that look like? Um, that's a tough one because I want to do everything. Um, if I had to pick one, I would maybe stick with testing winter oil seeds in the south, put in an organic system. Or I would also like to do some work gauging farmer interest in trying new crops to see, like, if the crops I'm working with perform well here, would they actually be willing to use them? Awesome. If you'd like to get in touch with Brooke about her work, we'll have her contact information in our show notes. Thank you so much for being on the show today and best wishes on your future studies and career. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Field Lab Earth. More information can be found in the description below. Thank you. Thank you.